excellent. Cool. I, I think we should drink. Yeah, I, I like that plan. So this is a Balmore from 2002, which makes it 12 years. Well, the 2002 doesn't matter, but the 12 does. Yeah. Oh, we got to start uh, over. Oh, uh, uh, no, it's worked. <laughs> no, it just, it's dried out. Turn it off. The revolution is here. A movement of people free to live, work, and choose. We won't tell you what to think. We just demand that you think for yourself. This is Kibbe on Liberty. That will not. All right, so. Ben right. Nevis 91. Let's take a look at that. I can't tell you anything Cast about strength, it. Cast strength, okay. <laughs> yeah, we don't mess around here. Yeah. Cheers. Mm. We should Cheers. S- we should celebrate the fact that um, the dictator of Washington D.C. has, in her infinite uh, magnanimous nature, is that even a word? Magnanimous. Magnanimous. Has said that I no longer have to show my Vaxport papers in order to go to, to a anywhere. restaurant. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the science, I guess, is settled again. Once uh, Fauciism has moved north to Canada. So yeah, that's yeah. The <laughs> but I thought what we, what we would do, actually, is is talk about the world post-Canadian trucker because the, the world has changed dramatically just, just in the last couple of days. Um, Justin Trudeau, uh, showing his fondness for the, for the Chinese regime, has basically imposed martial law and is is ready to seize the financial assets of any trucker that disobeys him. But the cascade effect has been a fundamental change in political science. Yeah. We now understand that um, doing these draconian lockdown things and vax ports and masking children and all the things that we've been doing for now two plus years will have political consequences and that has changed things. So I feel like there needs to be a reckoning and an assessment of of what um, I guess the mistakes that have been made and and what what were well meaning and what were more pernicious and and who we should hold accountable and I went back and watched the we we, we did a, an episode together on April 1st of 2020 yeah it was only two weeks into flattening the curve yeah and I, it was kind of funny because I mispronounced Fauci's name because I'm like, there's this guy who's on TV all the time and he seems really full of himself. And <laughs> later on, we would discover just how full of himself he was. But what's your, what's your take two years in? Like, where are we at? Well, I don't think anyone would have predicted that it would have gone on this long. That's uh, really the first yeah. big takeaway. But I think what we're also seeing is a very rapid collapse, finally, of all these lockdown or politicians, they're uh, realizing that, hey, there's an election around the corner, or uh, in some of the other countries, they're realizing that the protests are getting very intense. And the longer that they keep sustaining this illusion of a, uh, a lockdown regime and all these other policies that come with it that don't seem to have really done anything significant over the last two years, uh, the, the more they imperil their own political career. So we start to see some changes. Yeah, it's. It's kind of funny that uh, I, I didn't have it on my playlist that truckers from Canada would be our liberators. Right. <laughs> um, there's, there's actually supposed to be a, a, a truck convoy coming to D.C. in the next couple of weeks. We'll see, we'll see how that emerges and, yeah. and what. Um, and another, I guess it was in Paris, the, the mm-hmm. irony of the government setting up truck blockades. Yeah. To block truckers, to block truckers from, blocking from blocking the city. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, government. It, there, there's like a tension here. The people that were uh, all in favor of lockdowns, willing to shut down entire countries' economies for uh, weeks, if not months, some cases even years on end, are now uh, upset because truckers have shut it down for a weekend. Yeah. So there's a, there's a weird inconsistency here, and they're calling the truckers terrorists because they've blockaded a bridge for a weekend, whereas they shut down the border for the previous two years, and suddenly somehow that's not economic terrorism. Yeah, yeah. Shut, shutting down the economy is only okay when we do it. That's the message. <laughs> so April 1st, 2020, um, when did the Great Barrington Declaration get released to the public so that was uh, it was signed on october 4th 2020 uh, okay. and came out the next day 
so so much later. Yeah, yeah. And and your, a lot of your work and and the work at AIER in the last couple months or so have been trying to discover um, the conspiracy that that Fauci and his cohorts um, um, engineered to smear the signers of the Great Barrington Declaration. That is exactly tell, it. Tell the story. Yeah. This is insane. Yeah. So if you go all the way back to October uh, 2020 when we issued this document, uh, you know, it immediately started to get the attention of the press. I think the next day, uh, uh, Laura Ingraham or someone did, had did it on Did you guys Fox. know how big this would be? We didn't. Yeah. Uh, we, we thought, uh, we were actually sitting around the dinner table the night that the, uh, the conference took place, and we thought, hey, maybe we'd have 10,000 signers by the end of the year if we released this thing and put up a, a, you know, a simple website where people could voice their support. Yeah. And we had 10,000 signers, I think, by the end of the, the second day that it was out, and it blossomed to, uh, now, now we're somewhere in the neighborhood of a million people worldwide have signed it. Uh, so it really did kind of catch us off guard on how uh, quickly it went viral. And I think that is one of the things in retrospect, we look back uh, and like, had we done it differently, we would have anticipated uh, a much heavier uh, reaction to it. But that also includes some of the dirty tricks that the other side played. And this is where the story got really interesting. As you know, we released on uh, October 4th. It starts to go viral uh, the next day. Uh, then two days later, uh, and this is what we just discovered a couple months ago through a Freedom of Information Act request. Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes for Health, uh, Fauci's boss, sent out an email two days after the Great Barrington Declaration hit to all of his senior staff, especially Fauci and Deborah Burks and all those uh, familiar names were on there, uh, basically said, uh, these are fringe epidemiologists, I'm quoting them there, uh, we need a devastating public takedown of the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, so it's basically like a command coming from on high in the NIH. These supposed follow the scientist uh, experts were saying, no, we need a political takedown of this document that's challenging our, uh, our push for a lockdown regime. So let's, um, uh, let's, let's focus on fringe epidemiologists first. The, the phraseology is fascinating um, because the, the credentials of the three signers are as, about as top tier Whatever the is. standard is, yeah. they're the best. Yeah, they are. Uh, so the three core signers, it's uh, Martin Kuldorf, Jay Bhattacharya, and Sinetra Gupta. They're all uh, well-regarded, well-known epidemiologists, scientists that work on, um, on infectious disease. And these are people that have tens of thousands of medical citations to their names. Uh, they taught at top universities. So uh, Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford are represented in that group. Uh, and immediately after that, they started to pick up some other scientists from other universities uh, that joined on uh, with the effort. And this was noticed by Francis Collins, who he's saying, we need to take down the fringe epidemiologists. They even have a Nobel Prize winner, Michael Levitt, yeah. who has signed on to the agreement. But they're fringe epidemiologists. Yeah. So that, and that gets the, you know, the other half of that is the, the, the conspiracy here is like, what, what are, what are, public officials, um, health, public health bureaucrats doing, conspiring to mount a political smear campaign. Is that, is, is that normal? Have you ever heard of, I'm, I'm sure it happens. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a paranoid enough libertarian to know that this happens, but it seems pretty out there. Well, I think it's quintessential public choice theory. So as libertarians, we, we look at this and we expect the worst of bureaucrats. But uh, the uh, this high school civics class version of bureaucrats is they're these uh, selfless, public-minded officials that are just trying to do what's best for the country. And Fauci has really presented himself as that. Uh, you know, he goes on TV and says, if you attack me, you're attacking the science. Uh, I'm just an administrator. I'm not playing the political game. But what the emails reveal and what Fauci's other behavior reveals is he's, he's actually kind of like this J. Edgar Hoover-style uh, bureaucrat that's at the top of this agency and is working behind the scenes constantly on uh, manipulating the media, on trying to change the narrative around uh, whatever policy he happens to be advancing, on, uh, on, on really trying to shape the science rather than uh, follow the science. So he's, uh, uh, and this comes straight forward from, uh, straight out of the emails, what you see in his uh, response. 
is uh, here's a guy that's not uh, just an administrator of this agency. By the way, the agency is a multi-billion dollar scientific funder, so they have uh, a finger in, in that game as well. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of it, here he's trying to set the tone for what scientists should say, what the only approved message out of the U.S. government uh, should be, and everyone else is fringe or discredited. Uh, and yes, the question, like, the guy that controls billions of dollars of funding is also saying that there's only one way to look at the science, and what do you think everyone in all these universities that depend on the NIH for funding are going to do? They aren't going to dare question Fauci because that means that their funding gets cut off. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's like a perfect storm. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't really consider him a scientist. He, he's been in the government since he got out of school, um, but he's clearly a very skilled apparatchik. Yeah, and yeah. he's he's climbed the ladder, um, but he's also like a tremendous influencer. When you go to his whatever his homepage is at NAID. There's like the best of Fauci. Right. You can you can see all of his awards. You can see his media hits, and it's basically a, a PR firm. You know, yeah. this is supposedly about um, preventing infectious disease, but but you know, it's a PR shop. Yeah, he's a quintessential narcissist, and I think that's really come through over the last two years. We see him on TV all the time, but uh, you know, he he's camera hungry. And this is what Scott Atlas pointed out uh, when Scott Atlas came in in the Trump administration uh, as the person to be the other voice to challenge some of the lockdown. He noticed right away after some of the first meetings that uh, he would bring in scientific papers. You say, here's the latest study that shows this mutation in COVID or shows uh, uh, lockdowns aren't working. And he'd present them before the panel. And Fauci would have no interest in that. There's even an anecdote in his book where he has Fauci keeps mispronouncing some medical term that he was referring to in this high-end article when they're trying to diagnose the disease. And what it really comes down to, and Atlas said this, and we saw it firsthand in the email releases, Fauci doesn't actually study the science. What he does is he, he aggregates talking points of things that he wants to pitch to the media in any given day. And this is where it gets really insidious. Those talking points often come from the media itself. Yeah. So in, the res in response to the Great Barrington Declaration, he didn't go out and read uh, a bunch of papers, uh, scientific papers, that challenged this view being put forth by uh, Kuldorf and Gupta and Bhattacharya. Uh, he actually went to Wired Magazine, in the, and they had just run an article attacking the Great Barrington Declaration. And this article is actually like one of the uh, most boneheaded uh, commentaries I've seen of the entire pandemic. Uh, the Wired Magazine article says, why is the Great Barrington Declaration talking about lockdowns? Those are in the past. Those are behind us. We aren't going back into lockdown again. And this is October 2020. And this is the first piece that Fauci sends around to the top leadership of the NIH and says, use this to attack the Great Barrington Declaration. Now, one of these guys published in The Nation as well, yeah. which is, um, you know, it's not exactly Pravda, but it it's, sort of is. <laughs> it's kind of the, the, this fringe, uh, far-left... Not a scientific outlet, yeah. uh, by any means. It's an editorial outlet. And that's the second thing Fauci gets. And we also find, uh, we can infer, because there's all these redactions in the emails that they gave us, but we can infer at some point he commissioned one of his chief of staff figures to go aggregate all the articles that they could against the Great Barrington Declaration. And it's the standard lineup of these generally left of center to far left of center political editorials. So you have Fauci is being called up by the media to offer a commentary on the Great Barrington Declaration, but what he's really doing is he's parroting back to the media editorials that the media has already run, and then they use those editorials period, parroted right back to him to affirm or reaffirm their position. So it's like this echo chamber that he's developed. Uh, there's not any science behind it at all. It's just playing the media game. Yeah, so, so uh, Matt Ridley was on the show, and, and he talks about the um, a similar uh, PR campaign with some of the same characters and some other guys who you would know um, better than me but there was a PR campaign to smear anybody that suggested this might come from a lab yeah. even though the initial reaction amongst among scientists was well yeah this probably came from a lab it it obviously has those characteristics but um, the the thing I talked to Matt Ridley about is the hysterical, concentrated, purposeful effort to smear 
the lab leak theory just makes it all that more credible in my mind. It's like they're trying to divert, they're trying to cover up, they're trying to change a subject. Is that what they're doing with the Great Barrington Declaration? Like, I think the formula is almost identical. And, yeah. you know, I've read some of those emails as well from when they were trying to quash the lab leak. It uh, played out almost in the exact same pattern. Francis Collins, head of the NIH, sends out an email to his, uh, his upper-level staff, including Fauci, and says, hey, this theory is gaining legs in the media. We have to quash it. We have to, uh, to take it down right now for political reasons. Never any engagement of the evidence, never a, a weighing of the pros and cons of the different arguments that are being made. It's, uh, we've already made our minds up. This is the political line that we're going to take, and we have to kill it. And, and by the way, if that proves, if it proves to be true that it came from a lab, and every day that comes by, it seems more and more likely that yeah. that's actually true. Um, covering that up is not just um, political butt covering, it's potentially costing lives every day because the response is not modulated towards the facts as they were. It was based on some narrative that turned out to be false. Absolutely, yeah. And you see this in some of Fauci's prognostications. So he wrote this very strange article. I think it came out about September of 2020, and it was in the, uh, the academic journal Cell where he's talking about uh, like a, the future of yeah. pandemics in the yeah. world. And uh, I, I call it a blueprint for Fauciism uh, when you read this article. And it's all about how we have to radically upend and uproot society based on the premise that there are these diseases out there in the wild carried by animals. And that the more that people travel around the, the, the globally integrated world, uh, the more that there are goods crossing borders and people going to different countries, uh, the chances that they're going to encounter these animals uh, and then catch and spread the disease as it mutates into uh, a human contagion uh, radically increases. So he, he gets into here and says, basically, we need to redesign how our cities are set up, redesign how we do travel. Um, it's this radical overhaul of human society, but it's premised on uh, this disease being something that comes out of nature that we could just stumble across at any given point. Uh, it turns out, if that's not the case at all, if this is actually a human error, a human accident, someone uh, was not careful in a lab in China and they walked out and uh, passed this virus to uh, the general public, you know, that's a very different set of responses we should have to it than uh, upending um, every aspect of our globally integrated economy to uh, basically ward off against future pandemics. Yeah, this article in Cell, um, and I forget the name of it, It's it's got a fairly nondescript title, but that the, the paragraphs you're describing um, sort of inspired me to, to go back and, and reread Hayek's Counter-Revolution of Science. Absolutely. And, and it, was, it was scientism, um, one in the sense that, you know, Fauci, the, uh, what, what, is, what is he? Is he a viro- virologist? What would you call uh, so, him? So uh, his background is in allergens. It's, okay. uh, yeah, and, he, and he works in, uh, in various diseases. But, uh, but his, um, his vision for the future goes way far afield of whatever his yeah. supposed scientific expertise is and, and gets very much into um, you know, reimagining society. He, he actually uses the phrase "bend modernity." Absolutely. Um, and I, and I, it reminded me very much of the original socialists who who blended sort of a, a fetish fetishizing of science with uh, applying that to politics and human action and all of that. And this, you know, there's this uh, guy named en- Henri de Saint Simon. Yeah. Who is supposedly he's a he's the father of scientism, but he's also the founding father of the word socialism Absolutely. as well. <laughs> and so these things come together in kind of a kind of a creepy design. And you know, um, Glenn Beck's very much focused on the Great Reset, but I think it might be more radical than that. And it, it gets back to that sort of pretension that they yeah. could they could sort of treat us like lab rats and organize society from the top down. Well, it's, it's central planning run amok, and this is just a medical form of central planning rather than economic central planning. We saw that in the epidemiology models that Fauci seized on and several of the other governments the world seized on, famous one being the uh, the Neil Ferguson model out of Imperial College. And I know we talked about that when it was in its infancy back in April yeah. 2020. And, you know, here's a fascinating story. 
Neil Ferguson runs this model uh, first for the U.S. and U.K., and it's predicting millions of deaths, like uh, COVID catastrophe. And this isn't um, aggregated deaths over multiple years. This is supposed to peak in, like, July 2020. Uh, so very rapid acceleration of deaths. And I think the model only ran for a year after, so we're, we're long past that. He expands the model to, I think it was uh, almost 200 different countries. Uh, so about 10 days after the first model came out, they released a second paper that listed all their projections of deaths for every country on Earth. Yeah. And I did a, an analysis of it one year later, the one-year anniversary, to see how it held up. And of the three main models that they ran, two of the three had overshot all 200 or so countries. Uh, every single country in, uh, on Earth was below the threshold that they had predicted. And the only model that actually uh, was surpassed, their death projections were surpassed, was this radical China-style 75% lockdown, held in place for a year until a vaccine comes in place. So it's like welding people in their apartment style model. And it failed in, I think, like a 180 out of 200 countries. They, uh, they still failed uh, in their estimates on that. Uh, so it's a disastrous performance based on this model that was a quintessential central plan. I mean, here's a guy that based his whole idea for how to study epidemiology on playing Sim City in 1996. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as the central planner, the guy that's dragging the, the, the buildings around and telling the Sims where they have to live, uh, this is the whole mentality that was brought to bear in the pandemic. And it's not economic central planning in the sense of the old Soviet-style bureaucrat that's allocating uh, uh, components of production. But it is epidemiological central planning in the sense that you pull this lever at this moment and it's going to change the course of the disease. Uh, you enact this lockdown or this intervention or this mask mandate at a certain point and it's going to alter the course of the pandemic. And they, the, the whole thinking is that we bring it under control by just doing the things in the instruction manual of the central planner. Well, it turns out they try all these things and none of them have uh, delivered anything near where they uh, were promising. You know, one thing that's telling, going back to to this notion of, of scientism, and you might have pointed me to this out to me first, but when you go to Neil Ferguson's Wikipedia page, it says epidemiologist, yeah. but when you look at his degree, he is a physicist. Right. His PhD is right. in physics. It's not in public health or epidemiology or anything else. And, and his model very much treats human actors as if they were particles. Yeah. To be manipulated and that there's no human agency here yeah and there's no adjusting in the model either to account for how uh, behavioral responses occur to these policies he's advocated and it's it's a really weird form of credentialism that's played because he's treated as this top epidemiologist uh this top disease modeler although Every single disease he's attempted to model, like the, uh, the the projections have been way off. Uh, here's a guy that's never gotten a single prediction right in his entire career, and, and he's only ascended in, in prestige as a result of that. Um, and yet, you ask other people, you know, there was an interview actually that Ferguson gave where they asked him, uh, uh, what's the highest level of biology that you have taken? And he answered, uh, the, equi the UK's equivalent of a high school biology class. Yeah. So I'm sitting here thinking, I've taken as much biology as this guy. Uh, I'm sure he's very well versed in physics. That's what he studied and trained under. And he seems to know some degree of computer uh, programming. But uh, this notion that he's like this medical expert, the sage that can uh, speak from on high and tell us exactly what to do, um, is entirely media created. And, and yet, he's, he's he, as you said, he's ascended in credibility. And I... I'll have to ask you to speculate, but I wonder why it is, you know, based on your own research, he has been hysterically overwrought and wrong every time some new virus emerges as potentially yeah. the big one. Um, this one, I think, turns out to be more difficult than any of us anticipated, sure. probably because it has been manipulated. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. He's, he's still like orders of magnitude wrong about this. So how does a guy always wrong get more and more credibility every time he fails? Is this a, is this a public choice story? I, I think it is. Um, he's telling the press the catastrophe story they want to hear. It's the same phenomenon you see whenever there's a, a hurricane on the Gulf Coast or a hurricane coming toward uh, Florida. 
uh, you know, all, all the news media descends on the city where it's supposed to hit, and they end up taking pictures of like a some boat floating by out in the in the ocean. And you know, I'm not saying downplay hurricanes, but they induce panic. Yeah, they induce mass panic, and and millions of people that don't need to evacuate end up evacuating because you have uh, the camera guy down there on the shore uh, showing how bad the storm is, and and uh, and basically pleading like a, an alarmist disaster movie story about this thing that's bearing down on us. Well, the same thing plays out in pandemics. Uh, the media likes uh, the million death toll uh, projections coming out of people like Neil Ferguson. Anyone that's saying, wait a minute, we should step back and look at the evidence, maybe exercise greater caution before we uh, make these bold policy decisions, that's just not a sexy story. Yeah. And by the way, there's a sort of a political ecosystem. I call it the pandemic industrial complex. Absolutely. And that like um, panic is not the end. The end is the cash that flows. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen money flow like um, I don't I don't know what the historical precedent would be. Maybe World War Two. Yeah. No, nothing like this before. But, but we declared war on covid and we lost. Yep. But not before we spent trillions and trillions of dollars just in the United States. And so much of that flows to the public health community, yeah. the, the nonprofits, and obviously the government is spending most of that money on themselves. Um, it's a lucrative business model if you're on the inside. That is absolutely the case. Uh, I mean, you, you want to take like a, a, a Niskanen budget maximizing bureaucrat model, core concept out of public choice theory. It says bureaucrats are in it for themselves. What are they trying to do? They're trying to grow their agency and make their job more secure. Uh, nothing has come along for the public health profession that's been better than a crisis to grow its agency, to grow its presence in the public sphere, uh, to justify expanding its budget. Because obviously, if there's a pandemic, we need to spend money on this to fix it. Uh, that's the planner's mentality. And I've not seen a single epidemiologist or public health official that's working in this sphere decline money that's come about because of the COVID crisis. So we now have this, this new infrastructure, this pandemic Absolutely. infrastructure, all of the you know contract, contact tracing is one tiny part of it. But the moment they announce that, I'm like, what's going to happen when all of those people whose job it is to follow me around, they're not going to go away. No, they'll, they'll and, reinvent themselves. And they're going to build databases and they're going to build technology and, and none of that goes away. But, you know, perhaps a more uh, draconian implication going back to Justin Trudeau, he, he um, declared new emergency powers yeah which were intended for, for acts of war. Right. He, he renamed it. It used to be called the, some, something. The War Measures Act. The War Measures the historical, Act. historical, yeah. Um, but he now has apparently un, unilateral ability to seize people's bank accounts. Yeah, yeah. And there's one place I know where that happens all the time, and that's in China. Exactly. Uh, based on your social credit score, if you don't behave like a good citizen... Um, their ultimate enforcement tool is to freeze your bank account. And yeah. so you, you can't buy food, you can't feed your family. What a great way to get people to fall in line. Yeah, it's just like the vaccine passports. Uh, if you don't have this, you lose your job. Uh, it's attacking people and their livelihood. And yet, yeah, that war measures uh, provisions that he's enacting, it's, it's only been enacted four times in Canadian history. Two of them were the world wars. Third one was Trudeau's father enacted it in response to a, um, a localized terrorism incident in Quebec, and uh, this is the second peacetime invocation of these powers, and it's taking a measure that was clearly uh, designed in 1914 in response to war. Uh, so, so it's a even if you object to the use of the suspension of civil liberties in war, and we can get into that. That's a whole other um, area of debate for libertarians. But uh, he's taking it and applying it to a peacetime protest that is essentially inconveniencing a city in ways that his own policies uh, were 10 or 100-fold uh, as uh, significant about doing that over the last two years. Uh, so, so it's really like a, an absurd exercise of power, and yet we're seeing it playing out in real time, and we're seeing him defending it as if he's like saving the country or something. Yeah. And and uh, the other thing that I think they, they, and a lot of public officials have said this, that they want to normalize wearing masks. Absolutely. And I think that's 
probably, I mean, it's nefarious and, and totally destructive to the development of children, but I think they want to raise a generation that is obedient and mask wearing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know how you get this to go away. I think, I think there has to be political consequences at the very least. Absolutely, absolutely. And that includes investigating some of these uh, public health officials that claim to be uh, the scientists. I, I mean, I'd even go so far as to say that, uh, you know, people like Fauci and Collins that were playing politics to try to suppress scientific dissent should be facing potentially even criminal consequences for uh, the misuse of their office. Uh, you know, that, that's for the investigators to decide. And these guys have uh, have made entire careers of trying to uh, play the political game and avoid consequences. Uh, you know, Fauci's someone, and I've argued this before, probably should have been fired for his mishandling of the AIDS epidemic in 1983. And yet he survived for 40 years. 40 years later, he's still around, still doing the same thing. Uh, so the question is, when does someone like that face consequences? Uh uh, maybe it's after he retires finally. Uh, you know, the guy's 81 years old. He can't stay around forever. But this is where, like, the J. Edgar Hoover comparison comes in. Yeah. You know, Hoover was this guy that was the head of the FBI for uh, decades upon decades upon decades. And no matter who was in office, everyone feared him because he, he kept enemies list and he kept files on everybody. Uh, he knew where the bodies were buried at the FBI. But as soon as he dies, as soon as he's out of office, his reputation has nosedived. It's plummeted. He, he's now recognized as the guy that, uh, that launched uh, basically like a terroristic government campaign against Martin Luther King. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I see Fauci's reputation after he is out of office, after he's uh, left this position, as being very susceptible and with good cause uh, to a similar tarnishing. Uh, in other words, all the dirt that Fauci has uh, managed to keep under control while he's in power will eventually come out. I think it was Jay Bhattacharya who has said that privately his colleagues will come to him all the time mm-hmm. and you know, whisper, please keep it up. Yeah. You, you, you're doing God's work. Um, there has to be sort of like the, the dam is going to break at some point because there has to be, frankly, substantial guilt yeah. amongst amongst doctors and medical professionals who were sort of cowed into submission, like, I'm going to lose my grant, I'm going to lose my position. Um, at, at what point do they start breaking ranks right. and saying, you know what, this was, this was a humanitarian catastrophe, and I should have spoken up sooner. Yeah. Well, that's when you start seeing the long-term effects of the COVID lockdowns. Uh, when cancer uh, cases start to spike, maybe a few years to even a few decades from now because of all the missed screenings, when we start seeing a, uh, we have a flood already of substance abuse problems that took off during the lockdowns that we're just now starting to see the medical consequences of. Uh, but these aren't things that are just going to go away as soon as uh, uh, the COVID restrictions are gone. These are things that are going to play through the medical system for uh, years or even decades. That's when you start to see a shift in the focus on treating those problems, problems that arose directly because of the lockdowns, uh, directly because of these policies. Um, then people start asking the questions. Maybe this wasn't the wisest way to go about addressing this pandemic, especially since it doesn't seem to have done anything or accomplished anything in terms of uh, turning the tide of the pandemic. So we, we enacted these horrifically restrictive policies, got nothing for it, and yet the downside is going to be decades of other medical problems, social problems, economic problems. So I, I've... I have to admit, after spending almost two years digging through data, trying to find some some credible sources on on, uh, for instance, an increase in cancer deaths, an increase in cardiovascular disease, an increase in suicide, an increase in in developmental problems with children. I I read all of this anecdotal evidence that mm-hmm. that like you you can't actually learn how to speak unless you can see someone right. speaking to you. Which seems sort of obvious when you say it out loud, um, but I'm I'm sort of suspicious of the data. I'm probably like a lot of yeah. Americans right yeah. now, where I'm I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I'm I'm immediately skeptical of everything now that so-called public health officials say because I'm like, is this propaganda? Are you covering up for for past harms? What's your agenda here? And it's it's tremendously damaging to. Um, um, belief in um, medical innovation, for instance, right. like pharmaceutical companies have taken a drubbing uh, 
Sure. And frankly, they earned it. That's that's absolutely the case. So it, it may be that scientific credibility is one of the biggest casualties of this thing. And we've seen this play out already for, for the past two years. You have uh, people like Fauci that go on national TV and they lie to you. And then a month later, when the lie is exposed, they don't say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was wrong. They double down and defend it. So, well, I was lying to you for your own good. Yeah. And Fauci did this on the masks. He did this again on herd immunity, on vaccination rates. There, there are just dozens of examples of this. At some point, scientific credibility takes a hit, and it takes a hit in a substantial way. Uh, what does this mean going forward? It means that uh, people that are, are actually trying to do good research in those areas are up against an obstacle of, uh, of simply getting the public to listen to them. And uh, that's going to have downsides for uh, public health officials for decades to come because people, everyone realizes, hey, this was the instance where uh, they cried wolf too many times. Uh, or they realize even worse, uh, this is the instance where someone like Fauci, who was trying to plead his case from a trusted public official's perch, is actually behind the scenes manipulating data, uh, manipulating the media, engaged in these smear campaigns against anyone that would dissent or question his advice. Uh, really engaged in playing politics. So it's kind of pulled off the covers, pulled the curtain back on how these people really operate in their worst instincts. And now that the public has seen that, uh, you know, you're never going to uh, easily rebuild that trust. Uh, it's going to be many years or decades to, to even get back to the point that we were in, say, January 2020. Yeah. And and the other one that, that I sort of love the irony, even though it's it's tragic in, in practice, and, and I should preface this by saying um, I don't think either of, of, of us has been at all partisan during this whole thing. We've been, I think, a later episode we did, we were super tough on Trump. Absolutely. For embracing uh, Fauchism and lockdowns. And he, he platformed this guy because yeah. he loved the ratings. <laughs> right. And he was competing with Andrew Cuomo, who was getting better ratings than he was. Um, that said, the, the ultimate um, irony in this is the progressive left's embrace of, of a kind of classism that has made the rich richer, yeah. uh, and the laptop class has remained locked down, and, and you know they absolutely expect the Uber guy to show up with their food every night. Yeah, wearing a mask. <laughs> um, and, and now it turns out that they demand that truck drivers continue to work as they have throughout the pandemic. Yeah. And if they disobey, we're gonna we're gonna bring them to heel. So it strips bare this 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 maybe it was a naive notion that that the progressive left actually cares about the working class because they have nothing but disdain for them now. Yeah, and you see Gavin Newsom and AOC and all these uh, these prominent figures on the left. Uh, what are they doing? They're going to fancy dining galas. Uh, uh, events at the Met in New York City, and they're walking through in their, uh, you know, fancy attire, dresses, uh, having a grand old time partying. And what you always see in the back of these photographs are rows and rows of the servants, yeah, of the people that are actually attending and working the event, and they're all masked up and uh, and in their place. Uh, meanwhile, these these left wing celebrities are, uh, are are basically just flaunting every restriction that they uh, have imposed on everybody else. So it's it's revealing a hypocrisy that I think has always been latent on the left, especially the uh, uh, the ones that claim to care about the little guy, care about the laboring class, the the self appointed vanguards. If we want to go in the, uh, the 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 Leninist terminology, yeah, yeah, uh, it's like rules for everybody else, but not for me. And yet when push comes to, su- to, to, to shove, as we're seeing uh, during COVID, uh, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're not masked. Uh, they're going on vacation. They're dining out. Uh, they're attending events in public spaces at the same time that they've imposed restrictions on everybody else. And it, it's really kind of insidious. Yeah, the, um, watching all of the celebrities, celebrities party at the Super Bowl, you are out, sir. I am. It's time for a refill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Watching all those celebrities party at the Super Bowl. And by the way, I would love to get back to normal, and maybe we have to let this kind of hypocrisy flourish. But the, I, I can just say personally, um, I don't really want to go to a restaurant if I feel like the staff is being mandated yeah. to mask. And and I have no problem if they want to wear a mask, and some of them probably do. Sure, sure. Um, but you know, as long as there's still a mandate in D.C., I haven't gone to a restaurant 
it's um, in D.C. Hop over the river to Virginia. Just, just go to the free state of Virginia now. Um, but there has to be some sort of reckoning on this as well because the, the disdain, and it all, all goes back to natural immunity. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're a nurse, if you're a healthcare worker, if you're a truck driver, if you're someone working in food service, um, you probably got COVID the old-fashioned way. Right. You're out working right. your, your ass off. And and now we're firing them for, for refusing to get vaccinated. Um, and the left doesn't see the hypocrisy and they don't. They don't. Yeah. They don't see the violence that they're doing on on the people that they claim to defend. Yeah, this is a real turn on the left. If you go back to as recently as the early two thousands, yet organizations such as the ACLU were regularly putting up press releases condemning this type of a logic. Uh, they condemned some of the emergency powers that were enacted in the wake of nine eleven when they thought it was going to be a bioterrorism pandemic. Well, some of these same emergency powers have been used during COVID. And now you have people on the left, uh, including the ACLU, that have defended lockdowns, defended uh, vaccine mandates. There was, a, a, I think, a pair of top ACLU attorneys even wrote an editorial, and it was like the New York Times or Washington Post or something like that, where they defended the mandates that 15 or 20 years ago would have horrified uh, the executive leadership of these same organizations. Uh, so there has been a turn in the left towards a more authoritarian, elitist approach. And I think this comes with the uh, the political realignment we're seeing right now uh, taking place because of COVID. Yeah, I've been predicting this, and I think the, the Canadian truckers sort of manifest what I think this new political coalition Absolutely. is. You know, it's, 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 it's a right to go to work and feed your family. It's the right to leave your home. It's the right to have autonomy over your own body. And it's the right to speak your mind. And uh, like these, these obviously are, are small L libertarian values, yeah. but I, I really think they're kind of universal human values too. Yeah. And I think authoritarians, left, right, whatever, it's this whole bureaucracy that um, the only way we're going to get accountability is if, if that grassroots coalition yeah. rises up and, and, and fires the bad guys and then demands accountability for what they did. Yeah. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that show, make sure that you like and subscribe. Click the little bell so that you get notifications. And if you consume this via podcast, go wherever you want to go. We're everywhere. Kibbe on Liberty. The revolution starts now.